Welcome to Real Chalk, a Shrug Collective production. Mike Bledsoe here, stoked to be launching this network so that we can introduce you to amazing content providers like Ryan Fisher. We'll be posting new shows every weekday, so be on the lookout. As a thank you for listening, Thrive Market has a special offer for you. You get 60 bucks of free organic groceries, plus free shipping, and a 30-day trial. Go to thrivemarket.com slash realchalk. This is how it works. Users will get 20 bucks off their first three orders of $49 or more, plus free shipping. No code is necessary because the discount will be applied at checkout. Many of you will be going to the store this week, so just hit up Thrive Market today. Go to thrivemarket.com slash realchalk to get set up. Enjoy the show. And here we go, coming at you. You guys are tuned in to the Baba Shrug Collective. Hope you guys are having a blast with this whole new concept we came up with. This is Yaya, and this is the newest episode of the Real Chalk Podcast. This week, we sat down with Ryan Williams from Industry Threadworks. Ryan's whole business basically is helping other businesses become successful. So he's seen it all, he's heard it all, he knows all the excuses, and he definitely knows everything that can go wrong in their early stages of a business. He's started multiple companies himself, And it's now focusing on helping other businesses become more and more successful. So this is literally the source of it all. I've asked many people the same questions, but I feel like Ryan is in a perfect position to answer these things like, why do people fail at the beginning of a business? What are the most common mistakes? And all those things that I'm sure on your guys' mind as well. And Ryan did a great job answering them. Dude also drives a Lambo. So you guys know that he knows what the fuck he is talking about. As always, guys, we're fucking stoked to be here. I can't stop cussing. I'm sorry, Mom. But I'm not starting this recording over, so we're just going to use it. And we're stoked to be here. Like I said, would love for you guys to subscribe to the channel, leave us a comment or a review, and then always love to interact with you guys. It's at Yaisview on Instagram, at Ryan Fish on Instagram. Or send us an email, yaya at crossfitchalk.com, ryan at crossfitchalk.com, with comments, concerns, remarks, nudie pics, whatever it is, just send it our way. We love interacting with you guys. And I'm going to stop being an idiot, let you guys dive into the episode. Hope you guys have a blast. Cool. All right, kids, we're live again. Coming at you live from Fish's couch. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hanging <laughs> the out. Couch is notorious. <laughs> got Yaya here, sitting down with Fish. And we got Ryan from Industry Threadworks, owner, founder, all that good stuff. Yeah, the one. One man show for a while. There you go. <laughs> As usual. Awesome. Yeah, so um, we have a lot of different topics. Like Fish and I were kind of talking about where we want to take this podcast. And I think we're just going to jump all over the place. Awesome. Um, just try and keep up with us as much as you can. Perfect, man. That's, that's how my <laughs> brain works too. We'll so. start it nice and easy. I'll just let you talk about yourself. Everyone loves doing that. So... Mm-hmm. We'll start there, um, kind of like a story to where you started, how you got to where you are now, and we'll just interrupt you okay. anywhere in between. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Um, I normally wouldn't get this in detail of my, my background, but yeah. um, since you brought up like the snowboard thing and everything, um, so I, I, I grew up super poor, uh, which is why I like money so much now. <laughs> of course. Everybody does. Because being poor fucking sucks, dude. And I've been there as well. Yeah. Um, so I grew up super poor. I went to, I never lived in a house longer than two years. I never went to a single school longer than two years. Um, I went to five different high schools in three different states. Didn't graduate any of them. And that was due to what? Just your dad's job or? No, my mom and my dad weren't married. Okay. Um, so I was living with my mom and we were just poor. So she'd kind of like take whatever job she could, teaching at like a university and stuff. Gotcha. Um, it was always in the same city. We just moved from location to location. Um, but then I turned 15 and went to live with my dad for a while. Through party, he got pissed, kicked me out, so I had to go back and my mom. <laughs> she moved to a different state. Anyway. It, was the party worth it? No, it sucked. Oh, <laughs> no! <laughs> it wasn't even that good. It wasn't even that good. But when you're like, when you're like 15, like, you have a beer and you think it's like the greatest thing in yeah, the world. Yeah, totally. Yep. Um, Once you turn 21, you stop drinking, actually. I know, it's no fun anymore. <laughs> yeah. Hard, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I did all the bad shit when I was 15. And yeah. I'm like, all mellow. Same. Um, so, yeah, I grew up super poor, bounced around a lot, dropped out of high school. Uh, military was nowhere on my radar. When I dropped out of high school, in fact, I had a conversation with the uh, 
principal or whatever. And he's like, you know, you're never going really to get in the military with the with, without a high school diploma. I'm like, I don't, I don't give a shit. Like, I'm leaving. Like, yeah. see ya. Mm-hmm. You still got one anyway, though. Yeah, well, yeah, I went and got a GED. Because um, it's not that I was dumb. Uh, my credits didn't transfer over. Because I went through so many different high schools. Oh, the yeah, credits yeah, would yeah. transfer. And they're like, hey, you're going to have to come back next year and redo the first half of your senior year. I'm like, no. Yeah. Yourself. <laughs> I'm leaving. So, so um, I went to Mammoth. Uh, I was a lift operator. Just stoned. I was a lift operator all day long. Like, watching the little kids, like, just drop bombs off of the <laughs> lift. It doesn't sound unfamiliar at all. Yeah. yeah. They all seem about like this. They all, they all seem like they're the same person at every lift. It really is. The yeah. lift operators? Yeah. yeah. I was that person. Like, I had, like, almost, like, dreadlock hair. Like, I was definitely, like, a little hippie. Um, and after that, I went to uh, Lake Havasu, and I was going to be, I was going to try to get on the uh, circuit, the freestyle circuit for freestyle jet skiing. Oh, sick. But I had... I had a jet ski and had a little truck, but I had no trailer and no friends, so I couldn't even get the jet ski in the trailer. <laughs> so I Not only had a trailer, but no friends. <laughs> yeah, no friends. I, I love that part. <laughs> so I ended up so like... So the dream ended before it ever started. <laughs> yeah. I, think I, I think I went... I was there for like a year, and I went skiing like one time. Uh, and then the jet ski was ended up being in my living room as a couch. And like, <laughs> I took the trailer off my sick. truck, my little Zuzu, and I put that, and that was like my dining room table. So I'd like sit on my jet ski... And eat on my camper trailer. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Eat like the tuna surprise. Wow, I love that so much. Next level. It was uh, tuna rice and mustard. Was like the, the tuna surprise. I lived on that for like the tuna years. surprise. <laughs> that sounds amazing. like a sushi roll. But when, yeah, you, like, yeah. when you're like 19 or 18, 19, like that's just life. You know yeah. what I mean? Like I wouldn't want to live like that now because it'd be like, oh my god, this sucks. Yeah. But at the time, dude, you're out of the nest. It's your first time. You're like. You love it. You yeah, know, it's like, great. Yeah. Fuck yeah, tuna surprise. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, what's for dinner tonight? Yeah, ooh. <laughs> I'm gonna splurge and get myself a grilled cheese sandwich. You know? <laughs> um, See, so yeah, I learned a lot, man. Um, that put me from dropped out of 17, so that put me at 19, and then I was like, okay, I wanna, I wanna do something. You know, I wanna find out who I am as a person, as a man, and my place in the world. So it's like, okay, what... Do you have any idea where that feeling came from? Because you were saying, like, you move out and you, you're living in this house and, like, nothing is, really bothers you when you're 18. Where do you feel like... Was there, like, a certain moment or a conversation or something that turned you into, like, fuck, I gotta do something about this? Um, you know, that's a good question. I don't know. Uh, my dad wasn't around growing up, mm-hmm. so... And my mom's, like, super hippie. So growing up, I was always... I've always been myself, but I was steered very much toward, like, this, like kind of pacifist uber hippie lifestyle Mm -hmm. and I always kind of like didn't I was a little more punk rock than that you know I didn't didn't want I didn't fit you know I was trying to fit but I'm like this isn't really me and I went and lived with my dad and he's the complete opposite like hyper masculine like honestly kind of an asshole um nice guy like great dude but not a very good dad the nice kind of asshole right yeah Yeah. (laughs) he's melody now he's great we have a great relationship now but back then it's very tumultuous, um, but he wasn't around. So for me, I think growing up is like having bridging these two worlds of like hyper masculine and and you know uber hippie. It's like where do I fit in that? So for me, um, this is before the internet too. So you had like, I mean, there's nobody, you have nobody to turn to. There's no like, you can't Google anything. Yeah. Like, who else has this thing? You know. So I was like, okay, what what can I do to find out who I am? And I thought, okay. I got it in my head that I need to find the hardest thing I can possibly do and just just go see it. You know what I mean? Like roll the dice and see where I fall. And if I'm going to roll the dice, I want to roll the dice as high as possible. And then if I don't make it, then I'll try something a little less hard, maybe a little less hard and see where, <laughs> where I fall on the scale, you know? Yeah. And I think at that age, almost everybody at some point wants to be a Navy SEAL. Like, I think everybody at some point thought about that as a child. Like, I'm a G.I. Joe. Yeah, yeah literally. Yeah. I think, I mean, I I have my own story on that for sure, but it was something I definitely wanted to do when I was around that age. Yeah, well, how old are you now? I'm 31. Okay, yeah. But the whole reason I live in California is because I wanted to be a city. Oh, no way. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if you knew that. Uh-uh. No. But I actually got laser surgery in my eyes. I had oh, to get yeah. PRK instead of LASIK because that was the only one that they yeah. actually um, took. And then I had a ton of different recommendation letters. I had one from the Brigadier General of West Point, Damn. and I had another one from a general at Annapolis, and I was trying really, really hard to get an officer billet, 
and I just couldn't get it. So then I was like, I don't know if I want to go in as an enlisted guy because yeah. I've always been like plagued with injuries. So I was like, I was like, the worst thing that would happen to me is I'd go to Buzz and I'd get an injury and I'd you know keep getting rolled back, rolled back. So I started doing CrossFit as a way to train, and that's when I basically I lived in Utah at the time. I was on the Olympic bobsled team, and then I moved to California because I was like, oh, I'm gonna go train with some of the seals in San Diego and this and that and yeah. blah, blah blah, and I did, and then. I also got really fucking good at CrossFit during that time, and everybody's like, you need to compete, you need to do this, yeah. and then I had one year until I was allowed to go in um, for my eyes to heal, and I went through pretty much everything, um, I forget what it's called, like when you go and they make you duck walk and like, you know, smash your knees oh, on the ground and they stuff. Have, they have like the, the mini, like the mini buds, which is like the officer, it's part of, they have a couple different programs. But I think that's like a main... But I went through like the physical part where they make yeah. you do all these like weird things and, and then... Um, Just the miserable shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So then I was like, okay, like this is what I want to do. And then it, it found, it was like a reality that I wasn't going to get an officer billet. And I was like, shit, I don't know what to do. So and I just kept super, crossfitting. They're super hard to get. Now. Super, super hard. Yeah. So I just kept crossfitting and then it kind of turned into, you know, my career that I have now. But that was literally like all I wanted to do for such a long time. Yeah. That's was such, that, a, was that such an awesome example of like that you have to be able to like pivot in life. You know what I mean? If all you, if all you had your eyes set was like the Navy SEALs, like this is what I got to do. And like everything else, I'm just going to ignore what's happening to a left and right. You wouldn't have anything that you have now in your life because you were able to adapt. You're like, well, this might not work out. So what am I going to do next? And you're already doing CrossFit. You're like, I'm pretty good at this. So you just kind of like shift into that. And we talk about that all the time, how that can make such a huge impact on your life if you're able to do that. A lot of the things that you're not really looking for always wind up being... Dude, absolutely. Best Somebody told me a sure. great quote the other day. It's like, once in a lifetime opportunities happen a couple times a week if you're open to it. You know, you know what to look for. I heard <laughs> that. I, like I was that. like, man, that's so true. You yeah. know? Yeah, that is crazy. Yeah. All right, so now um, you're looking for this challenge. Yeah, and I was like, okay, I can either, you know, at the time, what's the hardest thing I can do? I can either climb Mount Everest. Or I can try Talk to find that too. Seal. Really yeah, same right. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm like, I don't have fifty thousand dollars to to climb Mount Everest. Um, so like, okay, I'll, I'll start looking in the military. I looked into some other branches. Um, Air Force has CCT and PJs. PJs. Uh, Marine Corps as super hardcore, but it's just, it's just not my style, you know. Um, Army's different. They're all. It's like they're all ice cream, but they're all just different flavors of ice cream. So like, if you don't like Rocky Road. Don't go buy marshmallows and chocolate chip ice cream because they're like, yeah. fucking hate it, you know? Um, <laughs> so they're all very similar. We do all work with each other. But at the time, I didn't know that. So I went into all the recruiters' offices and kind of got a feel for them. And luckily, just, you know, rolled the dice. and was like, okay, this is, I think this is what I want to do. Um, and trained for it, went for it, and um, was lucky enough to, to make it through um, without any major issues. And... Got to a team, uh, did six and a half years at Team One, three deployments, one before 9-11 where like, there's shit going on, so you're basically doing like, you know, uh, <laughs> like the cool guy tour of the world, hanging out in like Thailand and Australia, going to strip clubs, like just yeah, massive amount of cool stuff. Uh-huh. And you guys make pretty good money at SEALs, a lot more than everybody, like regular enlisted guys. Yeah, more than, um, more than the regular parts of the Navy, yeah, yeah. which isn't a lot but um it's more than it's more than normal um yeah then i got out or i didn't get out but i left team one in 2004 and went over and started becoming uh, an instructor at third phase um so i was instructor from 2004 to 2008 then i got out of military and took a job as a gs uh gs position as an instructor at sqt and it's funny that's where i met dave uh, oh. castro because we were actually like our offices our desks were right next to each other and uh, I was starting up Forge with Mikey, and uh, our first business, we had no idea what the hell we were doing. We just, you just was Castro in, involved in CrossFit at this time? He was, but nobody knew what CrossFit was at the okay. time. This so this is like, like 2005? Yeah, they, they hadn't even had the games yet. Okay. So I got my first certification in 2005 at like CrossFit Brand X or something, and I'm like, I was in pretty good shape at the time. Um, and I went, went there, and I'm like, oh, I'm going to crush this. And I just... No pacing, no nothing. They have this like four <laughs> a normal crossword thing, and I just got so crushed, dude. I'm like, what the hell is going on? Um, so I hated it because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I sucked at it. So I'm like, fuck this, dude. I'm just gonna go do curls in the corner. Um, but yeah, they, <laughs> but then because Dave uh, worked with us at SQT, 
I was talking to Mike. He's like, hey, we're having a little gathering at, uh, you know, my place, my parents' place up in... Um, the ranch? Yeah, the ranch. And uh, we're just going to do some do some workouts and stuff. I'm like, okay, cool, let's go. So we, Mike Was Dave in good shape at the time? The what? Was Dave in good shape at the time? Because I'm going to go ahead and say, like, right now, he's like, no. Nah. I don't think Dave's ever been in good shape, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm go on record. D- Dave has different priorities, I think. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, he hooked us up with that, and we went there, and um, you know what's funny, dude? Like, we had our booth selling t-shirts right next to uh, Bill Henniger and Katie Matter with Rogue, and they were just starting up, too. Oh, shit. Dude, a little, like, literally fold-up table, Yeah. and, like, we're here, they're there, and they have nobody to work. So like Katie would go compete and then come back and work the booth. And so in between, the booth yeah, she won that year. Dude, it was it was wow. a totally different scene there. And there was maybe, I think, you know, three or 400 people there. I mean, including spectators, including competitors. Yeah. It was a, a whole different world back then. Um, but yeah, it's really interesting to see like now, I mean, I mean, Rogue is obviously Rogue, massive. Um, but yeah, back then, dude, it's just like... Well, I used to now. work in Park City. That's when I was on the Olympic team. And um, Chris Bieler worked out in the gym that I was... I was a gym attendant in. No shit. <laughs> so I, I, used, I just cleaned up after everybody. <clears throat> and I remember seeing this little guy just like doing these very strange pull-ups, you know, which mm-hmm. now are butterfly pull-ups. But when he was doing butterfly pull-ups, people were doing kipping. Yeah, like, nobody No one had ever even seen was. a butterfly yeah. pull-up yet. And I remember he would always ask me to do this workout, like 21, 15, 9, thrusters and pull-ups. And oh, I'm like... God. And he'd show me what a thruster was, and I'm like... And it was 95 pounds. And I'm like, dude, that looks like, fucking dumb. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And yeah. then one day he's like, I'll give you 500 bucks. You can beat my score. He did it in like 202. And I was oh like. Oh, my God. And back then that yeah. was. I was like, okay. Amazing. Amazing. You know, yeah, not challenge yeah, accepted, sure. you know? Yeah. So my first time I did all the thrusters on broken every time. But then I would do these like really strange pull-ups. Like, it's like a mixture of strict and like. Me trying to figure out what a kipping pull-up was. Yeah, yeah so, so you're like kicking your knees into your chest type of yeah. thing, like trying to kip up somehow. So I did uh, four and a half minute Fran for my first Fran, my first CrossFit workout ever. Yeah. And I proceeded to vomit for probably an hour and a half after <laughs> Like I actually thought I had to go to the hospital. I for sure got rabbed out. Oh yeah. Dude, that's... It was I, really, really I'm bad. still scared of that workout. Dude. That's <laughs> what I'm like. I'd literally almost rather get stabbed. <laughs> well, the worst part is that the better you get, the more it hurts because the faster you yeah, go. Like, it never gets, gets better. Oh, it never gets God. better. So then he shows me a video. He's like, I went to the CrossFit Games and he shows me this video. And I'm looking at it and I'm like, it's like 2007. And he's doing it at this ranch mm-hmm. and he's doing the pull-ups and the, and, and the thrusters or maybe it was deadlifts or something. And he's like, yeah, this is the CrossFit Games. And I'm like, oh, cool. And then like, now we're here and it's right? it's what it is it's now. It's a whole but ecosystem it's crazy. by itself. Yeah, it's, <clears throat> it's so nuts, man. Um, so yeah, you're there and you have your booth. Bill's got his booth from Rogue. Old school. Yeah, we didn't know. Nobody knew at all what was going on with, with CrossFit was going to go, where Rogue was going to go, where Mike and I were going to go. Everything was just so new. I mean, looking back, you're like, I mean, it's obviously looking back, but like, we're all just like babies wandering around this new little garden that, that CrossFit built. And it's like, it's amazing what has sprung up out of that, man. It's been an absolutely incredible opportunity for, for us and, and um, just to see how it's come up and then also be kind of involved in the periphery, um, just in different areas. Um, it's, it's been like extremely beneficial for Forge as a company, like, I owe Dave a lot for, for hooking that up. Um, dude, he's, he's really helped me out a lot with that. Awesome. And a bunch of other things. I know you guys have your... Oh, no, I, honestly, I'm fine. I just, like, I wish that he didn't blast me all over the whole world and say that I was a fucking douchebag when <sighs> other people were doing the same thing. But either way, honestly, I it was probably more in my favor. I think I got more popular after that than, than unpopular. Like... Because of yeah. that scenario, everybody actually hated Dave more than they hated me. So I, I got thousands of emails yeah. from people that were like, dude, Dave's a dick, blah, blah, blah. That's the podcast I was listening to this morning. The one where you're talking about um, that whole situation. Yeah. yeah. Was it on Barbell Shrugged? Uh, it was on yours. Oh, okay. Yeah. But yeah, man, I, I had a similar situation where with Demon Bells, right? Yeah. The, uh, the company with the kettlebells on it. Somebody was upset about something and, you know, dealing with... Like we were talking about, like dealing with a normal customer base, you're going to get people email like all kinds of random stuff they're upset with, like mm-hmm. like random stuff. Um, and somebody was upset with something that wasn't a very major thing, but she thought it was. I'm like, look, here, here's here's what we can do. I'm like, I'm really sorry if this happened. It's something like a, 
box wasn't like perfectly tied up or something I'm like we're shipping 50 pound hunks of iron across the country like yeah it's it's not going to arrive like the box isn't going to look that great um so she's upset about something and then i was like look this is this is the best we can do um i think it refunded her full refund or partial refund whatever it was but anyway we took care of it pretty well she still wasn't happy i'm like look like i'm sorry but that's all we can do so like, well, i'm gonna blast you on this and that i'm like you know what i i hope you screenshot of this like i'm sorry but like this is like this is very normal this is the best we can do I'm sorry you're not okay with it but you know alright and so she ends up blasting it out and I, I didn't see it because it was in a private like uh, I think message area or something but then I get a couple emails like oh my god you're such a dick I can't believe you did blah blah, blah whatever she said I did but we got ten times more emails like hey I never heard about you guys I really like your product <laughs> yeah. and like I, I totally understand where, where you're coming from on this I think you took care of it pretty well and uh, we'd like to work with you and buy some of your product. So it was one of those things like, I was like, oh man, this really sucks. I hate letting people down. I never want them, if I give them a product, like I want them to be super fucking happy about it, you know? So it's always internally just, it, it, I take it personally when people don't like what we do or aren't happy with what we do, but there's a limit to where like, okay, fuck it. Yeah, if, right? you, can, if you can feel like you did your very best, you know what I mean? Then right. there's like no bad. There's, there's a reasonable backstop to that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, I have a friend who runs a, um, golf blog it's like actually pretty big and when Tiger got arrested for the DOI and like all those pictures came out they posted something on the Instagram I forgot what it was it was like a joke about the whole Tiger thing and they posted his mugshot on the thing and they actually got an email from Tiger's lawyer asking him to take it down and the guy was like, hell no, I'm not taking it down. Like, if I'm the guy who gets sued by Tiger Woods, <laughs> I'm fucking rich and famous forever. Because, like, anywhere this shit's going to come out, they're going to yeah. be like, who the fuck is this guy? Right? Oh, dude, and go to his cool, blog, yeah. and that's going to blow up. It that's really funny. is true. Any publicity is good publicity. Yeah. Good publicity. yeah. I think at, at a certain point, though, like, if you, the core of it has to be that you were right in the beginning. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it doesn't matter how the message gets out. But once they look into it, as long as the core of the message is the, that you were right, um, then I think I think you're, you're almost bulletproof at that point. You're like to show them, and that's what I did. People email me. I showed them, literally sent them the screenshots of the email, and like, and they're like, "Oh, I see your point. All right, yeah, <laughs> yeah. If you do your very best, then you can, you know, fight off the little things that happen like that, and they can actually yeah. turn around and help you. I think it all comes down to just consistently." doing the right thing and just being generally a good person like it, shit just works out yeah. you know it really does and it, in business and life and so many things dude you talk about that shit all the time so then you go from Forge to Demon Bells so now you're once again trying to build a brand yeah oh, there's another brand I, I built and sold a, uh, another pro brand called uh, Disciples of Iron so I sold that to um, a friend of mine a couple years ago and then Demon Bells so yeah, nobody nobody had come out with. Uh, we're the first company to come out on the market with faces. kettlebells with faces on, and I didn't intend to start the company. I wanted to go buy some. I'm like, dude, somebody must make these. You know, like I want a kettlebell with face with a skull on it. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. where can I buy one? Google it. Nobody made them. I'm like, well, I, I can't be the only guy that wants one of these. Yeah. It'd be pretty cool. So I went through the process of uh, starting a huge pain in the butt, man. I mean, that, that's. Equipment manufacturing is not a business I will ever get into again. Um, That's probably why it wasn't around. Dude, yeah, mad, <laughs> mad props to Bill from Rogue for doing what he's done because it is insanely hard to do what he does. I mean, it seems easy. You're like, oh, just make stuff and people buy it and you ship it. Like, no, no, no. It's, <laughs> it's a whole different process. Um, so, yeah, we ran into a, a ton of issues with that. We're able to, you know, pull some trapeze and be like, like, highs and lows like oh we're killing it like when they featured us at the games in uh, I think 2015 or something like that they did a close up on it and like I was like dude we're gonna sell a million dollars of this stuff be great we sold like I think like five grand that day and then it dipped right back out of the model yeah. I'm like what the hell is going on um, so massive highs and lows and then we're experimenting with overseas manufacturing in the beginning that was oh another nightmare um, especially when dealing with something that's so heavy it's like you have the shipping costs like all that shit like, yeah. same thing with Rogue again like they do such mm -hmm. an amazing job with that but like that's yeah. gotta be a challenge in that industry especially yeah absolutely man it, it's it's massively competitive uh, your margins are razor thin your product is super expensive it's mm -hmm. incredibly difficult to ship um, and the CrossFit CrossFit market is difficult to deal with um, you know gym owners are usually um, usually not killing it 
in the gym, you know? You know how hard it is to make a gym I'm like successful? One of, I'm like one of very few. Yeah. People, people reach out to me every single day. They're like, yeah. dude, how do you handle this problem? Like, what did you do to get here? Yeah, people don't realize yeah. how hard it is. And they think like, oh, I'm going to open a CrossFit gym and charge 150, 200 bucks yeah. and be rolling it in. Like, no, no, no. Like, yeah. mm-hmm. a CrossFit gym is 99% of the time just a passion project and you're lucky to break even. You and know? I think people are starting to realize that now because there was a time where like there was a new CrossFit gym opening up every oh, yeah. single day. Everybody thought it was just a money machine. Yeah, yeah. and everyone know. thought like, well, I love working out. You're one of the first ones. Yeah. Like Jason Kaliba or something like that, mm-hmm. which I've heard now that he's not even. Oh, really? Like all his gyms are kind of... Well, also the cycles, everything's cyclical, you know, whether a brand, and CrossFit is a brand. So yeah, totally. it runs in cycles and then you've got a million other factors that come into play with that. It, it, it is kind of a discretionary thing, and it's an expensive gym membership. Sometimes, you know, eight to ten times what a normal gym membership is. So you have to provide that much value. And then if most gyms can't provide that kind of value, you know, and you know what, what it takes to provide that value is your training staff and providing, like you were talking about on the podcast earlier, that lifestyle. You know, it's not just a quality thing. It's not just an equipment thing. It's It becomes a lifestyle. Like, why do people go... To chop. Why do people go to these things? Because they build feel, a community, build yeah, a vibe. Yeah, community, and they feel connected to the brand. Say, so I, I am this mm-hmm. brand. I, I'm involved in this community. This represents me. And I, I made sure that. that, like, every person was on my level. Like, I remember mm-hmm. I was uh, on other podcasts I've talked about. My first three months open, I coached every single class every single day because, and I had I had hundreds of people hit me up like, hey, I want to be a coach there. Blah blah blah. Like, I had been yeah. amping up my social media for months before I was even open. Like, I had over 100 members my first day. And my first class was 5 a.m. and my last one was 7.45 p.m. And I did God. every class, every day. I wrote the workouts. I did the billing. I did. I signed people up. I, like, yeah. I mean, I was sleeping three, four hours a night. I was training 10 to 20 minutes a day, like, little 10-minute parts. And I go to regionals and this and that. And I literally just like, unless someone came in and fucking blew me off my feet, I was like, you are not coaching here. Yeah. I've had people coach one class and I'd be like, nope. And they'd be like, dude, there was only one class. I was nervous. I'm like, I don't care. Yeah. You're out. Like, <laughs> no. I can already tell. No go. No, that's what it takes, man. <clears throat> it really, really is. Like, you never expect somebody to, I mean, the ideal as a business owner is you can replicate yourself and just like have a bunch of clones of you running around. That's fantastic. But the realities of that is like. It's, number one, it's not possible. And if you have other people with your mentality, like they're they're off doing their own shit. You know what I mean? They're off building their own business. I feel so like for hard. most businesses, you need to have the vision of like you're gonna own several businesses, or like your one business is gonna branch into other opportunities. And if you don't believe that, then you're probably gonna go into the wrong business. Like, yeah, it's not really necessarily delegation, but like it kind of is. And I think it's almost more important to hire somebody that can supplement you. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like Ryan and I are very different people, but we work very well together. And I yeah. think there's a lot of stuff that we're able to do because of the energy that we have in between us. Where if we were exactly the same person, I don't think that would work out. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Mike and I had that that issue when we first started up. I and mean, we literally flipped a coin to see who would be like... You know, president and vice president. We had, we had never done it. <laughs> Shut up, boy. We're, gonna, yeah, we're, we're in the lawyer's office. We're like, he's like, all right, who's going to be president? And who's going to be vice president? And we're like, uh. <laughs> so we flipped it. Um, he got president. I got vice president. Which I don't, it doesn't matter to me. Um, but we had, that's how little idea of what we were doing we had. We had no, no solid roles or sense of responsibilities or there was, there was nothing set up because we didn't know what to do. So the problems that we ended up running into was that we kept stepping on each other's toes on the things that we were doing similar. Um, but thankfully we were different enough to where he was good at a lot of things um, that I wasn't good at. And I was good at more like the technical side that he wasn't strong in. So what we were able to, what we were able to build together turned out to be much greater than um, what either of us could have built on our own. And we made so many mistakes those first couple of years. Even if you didn't build anything though, you already are way ahead of everybody else because most people have ideas and they don't do shit about it. Yeah. Okay. That's so the you, biggest thing is just execution. Yeah. Uh, was he a SEAL as well? Yeah. So you, right before we started the podcast, you were talking about something that is kind of like a misconception in a general world with like SEALs starting businesses. Oh yeah. I thought that was super <laughs> interesting if you want to go into that. Yeah. Well, the, the thing is like people always think if you're, if you're successful at a high level in something, then you must have some innate knowledge and that's going to carry you over to being highly successful in other things. And 
there there are a couple um, a couple guys who are Navy SEALs that have gone on to be you know successful to very successful like Eric Prince from Blackwater obviously is the, the most successful one I know of um, there's a couple other guys uh, and then me he's like you know medium edge on there um, but that's not that's not the norm you know and because where we're at now is we do uh, B2B uh, apparel production for other companies. So we're like the brand behind the brands. So when a company wants to establish um, an apparel product, we, we help them craft that product, make sure that it matches their marketing, all the other stuff that they've already built. And then we build the product out to make sure that it fits, make sure that they can sell it, they have all their, their social media platforms out, everything dialed in, and then we give them the product and help them push it. So we have a lot of team guys because I'm you know, a Navy SEAL riding around a Lamborghini, mm -hmm. all these guys, like, they hate me at the team. Like, oh, fuck this douchebag. And then they get out, and they realize nobody's going to pay them $100,000 a year to just hang out and be cool on the beach. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, fuck, what am I going to do? So then they call me up, like, hey, bro, let me pick your brain for the beers. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Um, and I, I used to, though. I used to hang out with them and walk them through it. Um, and what I found is that a lot of the guys... Um, They'd have this great idea, but they wouldn't come to me for input. They just wanted to hear validation that their idea was great. So I, mm -hmm. I take this idea and like, okay, this sounds good. Here, here's the good parts. Here's what I think will work. Here's the things that if you want to be able to scale up, you're going to have to change this and maybe think about modifying this or whatever. Give them constructive criticism. And they just be like, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm going to go do it. I'm like, well... Why did I bother? Why do you bother even telling me if you're not going to listen to the input I have? You yeah, know? and that happened so often that finally I was like, "Fuck it, I'm just not. I'm not going to help at all until they show like, okay, they build a little bit, and then I'll come in like, okay, cool. Like you, you put the time in, you put the effort in, you know, you have some stake in it, and then we'll go in like, here's here's how to fix it. But the biggest problem that I found is that guys who operate at high level like that, they tend to get a massive ego. Um, and this happens a lot with uh, uh, sports guys too. So like NFL, um, all these guys, they get a lot of money and they get treated like, like kings and queens and princesses. And then all of it dries up. So they get out of the military, their contract's gone or whatever it is. And they're left with like, okay, now what? And a lot of these NFL players end up working at like Home Depot and stuff, man. Yeah. A lot of these team guys end up like, you know, selling meat door to door and stuff. And it's because they're not willing to take a step down and be a new guy again and be open to learning. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm, you know, I have an ego too. Obviously, I'm, you know, a team guy. I'm going to have an ego. But I try to use it um, to drive myself to learn more. You know what I mean? Because, like, if somebody comes in and tells me I'm doing something totally wrong, I'm like, awesome, dude. Like, if you see something and I'm fucking up, like, let me know, dude. Like, let me take That's notes. Awesome. Yeah. Like, I, I want to fix this. I want to present the best product and the best service I can. And if there's a way that I can improve that, fucking, I'm all ears, you know. Um, but I've always been like that. But a lot of the guys that I talk with now, they're getting out of the military, and they're like, whoa, I just want to go shoot guns and have people pay me because I'm really cool. I'm like, well... <laughs> Business doesn't really work like that. Yeah. And, uh, but I, I fell into that too. When I first got out, um, Mike and I had no idea what we were doing. And we, we would go meet with these people that own like massive print shops up in LA and, uh, you know, licensing companies and stuff. And we'd let them know like, Hey, we're a couple of Navy SEALs starting a clothing line. And the Navy SEAL thing got our foot in the door. But the first couple meetings were terrible. I mean, we'd go in there and we'd like pitch and we didn't, have, we didn't have anything printed out. We had literally had like shitty tech packs on our computer just like showing them like, oh, hold on, let me scroll over. and <laughs> Like a total disaster, right? <laughs> but it got us in the door. So we'd go in there and they'd be like, hey guys, really great to meet you. Thank you for your service. You're really cool, but you're never going to make us any fucking money, so we don't care. And we're like... Fuck, dude. <laughs> like, that's, that's crushing to hear that. Yeah. Absolutely. But after it happened a couple times, we're, we, you know, driving back from LA and we're like, okay, nobody gives a shit. Like, we can use the Navy SEAL thing as a way to, to get these meetings and get the foot in the door. But if we don't learn how to offer value and, and prove ourselves within this, this new realm of business, we're, 
like we're gonna get door slammed in our faces all fucking day. Um, so we went back, totally redid everything, um, and did the best we could. And then every meeting we had after that was like they'd be like, "Well, it's kind of cool, but like here's where you're fucking up." And be like, "Okay, tell us how to fix this." Mm-hmm. And eventually we got to the point where we go into meetings like, "Okay, it's pretty good." And then eventually it, it worked out into where we we're you know fairly competent in what we were doing. Um, but it's always a progression, man. I mean, you know how it is. Business changes. I mean, you could be at the totally top of your game today, and in six months, shit will change, and what you've been doing today will be totally irrelevant. So yeah. if, if you don't have that mentality of constantly learning, those are the guys that we see struggle the most because they'll find a winning formula, work it for a while, and it doesn't and work. bank like, on that forever. Yeah. I mean, Blockbuster is a perfect example, right? right. That's like exactly. what, that's what I learned in school. It's like they were they saw the trend coming with Netflix and Hulu and all that stuff, but they were yeah. like, nah, this shit's working for us. We're going to yeah. keep doing exactly this. No, exactly How easy no. would it have been for them, you know, to pivot into something like Netflix, like an online marketing, and they could have easily saved their company. Yeah. And didn't they didn't they refuse a refused to buy, uh, was it Redbox or something like that? They're like, oh, we're not going to buy that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I think it's so yeah, important it's... to have like a healthy mix of like the self-confidence, but also then the vulnerability. You know, mm-hmm. like you you need the confidence because you're going to get door slammed in your face all day long. Shit's going to go wrong. You're not just going to start a business today and all of a sudden be successful and wake up tomorrow. So you need the self-confidence of like, all right, this isn't working, but I believe in myself. I believe in my idea. Right. And I know that one day this is going to work. But then also have the vulnerability on the other side to be like, okay, I understand I'm not perfect. And I understand that there's a lot for me to learn. And I think that vulnerability will take you a long way because you're going to be so open to like, please just help me. Yeah, it's a balance. But I think at the end of the day, like as long as you're trying to get better, you're going to fucking learn, man. You know, you're not going to be perfect. And so many people paralyze themselves to like, they have this idea like, oh, I'm going to wait. I'm just going to wait. It's one thing, just one more thing, one more thing. And like, Dude, fuck it. You know, you know, none of us would have an, an iPhone in our pocket if they waited to like, there's always one more thing to ask. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. yeah, like, you know what? It's when good this enough. happens, fuck then, it. then we'll do it. Yeah. Go to I remember website. asking one of my, um, my senior high school teacher. He was a good friend of mine and I ran track and uh, played a diff- bunch of different sports in high school. And he was like my best, he was like my, my favorite person when I was in school. And I remember just being like, hey, when I get out and I go to college and start applying for jobs about that. Like, what do you think like the best thing for me to like have on my resume? Cause I trusted him and he said, it doesn't matter what the fuck's on your resume. If you don't have communication skills. Yeah. He's like, he's like, you should write at the top of your resume. Like literally before all your cool shit, just be like, I work really well with people. Yeah. He goes, and you'll fucking crush it. And like, I didn't understand that comment until I was like 30 years old. Yeah. And I'm like, exactly. look, I totally understand it. But I remember even Yannick here, like he, I mean, he works in my gym as a coach, and every coach I have right now, they literally all say to me, because my gym is so prestigious and everybody wants to work there, so if, you're, if you want to be a CrossFit coach, you want to work out. You want to work at Chalk. And they'd be like, well, hey, man, like, uh, is it cool that I have like this certification or this or that? I'm like, dude, can you fucking fix everything that happens in any class? And are you proficient enough to show the movements to anyone? And can you tell anyone how to scale something on the fly like, that's what I care about. Yeah. You can take all those certifications and go shove it. Especially if you can't talk to people. If you're not fun and you're not, like, providing energy. Yeah. There's so many people that are book smart and you literally can't even talk to them. They're like, Especially in CrossFit, too. Yeah. <laughs> they're yeah. so fit and you have a conversation with them. They're like, they literally can't talk unless they're doing burpees or something, dude. It's and that's why weird. great CrossFit <laughs> athletes are not necessarily great. Being a great athlete yeah. does not make you a great coach. No. You know? and that's no. almost in everything. And like going to art school, that was one of the biggest things that I've learned because there were so many kids that were way better artists than me, but they're never going to land a job because they can't hold a conversation for fucking 10 minutes. Yeah. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And speaking of the resume thing, too, I did this thing that actually got me my first job coming out of college because my teacher told me just do like one little thing that will make the person like smirk or like smile like on your resume where you're like, all right, I get it. That's kind of cool, right? So I had the regular resume print on the front and then the back of my resume was all like a little pattern I made out of my logo and inside of the pattern, if you really looked at it, was like a negative space and it said, I really need this fucking job. (laughs) (laughs) But you could only see it if you actually like looked at it. Yeah. So... Going into the interview, I was like, oh, I always wonder if they, if they saw this. And then I remember the job that I actually got it. And then the guy was like, and guess what? You got this fucking job. And I was like, oh, yeah. That's fucking dude, awesome. So, like, little, really cool. little stuff like that to, like, set you apart, you know? Yeah, man. Dude, if you learned that at 30, you're, like, eight years ahead of me. Cause yeah. I, I only reached, like, I'm 40 now. So, like, probably 38 when I finally realized that. 
because I've been building my own my own brands for you know seven eight years, but now that we're in a position where we're helping to build other brands, we we work so closely with the owners that we see how they run their operations, and it's the same problems over and over again. So I've learned so much more about business in the last two or three years of running this company that I ever did running my own brand. It's it's been absolutely exponentially fantastic learning process but the communication is key and we see it all the time where guys have like a great product a great mission this 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 thing but they have they don't communicate with their partner and they they both want the same thing but they're not communicating the same ways and then they, they totally miss each other and they, they escalates and then it just blows up and we've seen like you know multi-million dollar brands just implode over this stuff oh, yeah, like consistently sure. and mm-hmm. it's it's for the same reasons and um I read a book a couple of years ago. I, I wish I'd read it when I was like in my 20s. We always, we always have a book recommendation on the show. So oh, this is probably a little bit different. Um, <laughs> 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 it's not a business book at all, but talk about like work-life balance. Um, it's a Playboy magazine. I think you might be. My <laughs> favorite is <edition. laughs> pretty close. It might be. I think you're also <laughs> um, But, you know, work-life balance, we all these highs and lows, and some of the biggest highs and the biggest lows have been with business, but they've also been in personal relationships. So to be, money's nice, but happiness is the real goal, right? 100%. Um, So to do that, you have to have a balance of of everything in your life that you you place value on. So for me, business is one thing, but it's, it's, it's fairly analog, you know what I mean? Like you can learn a couple basic things and as long as you continue consistently, you're pretty much gonna get where you need to go. Human emotions are a completely different animal. Um, so as far as communication, the one book that I, I wished I'd read when I was like 25 um, is called The Five Love Languages. And it totally it changed, actually. it's amazing, dude. It totally changed my perspective on, um, obviously, you know, male-female relationships. But I see a lot of the same value being put into the business relationships. Oh, okay. Um, because a lot of things, so like there's five different things that people value. I forget what they are. It's like one is touch, but you, you don't want to go like touch your business partner. Yeah, yeah. Touch, affirmation, like all yeah. This. yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you touch your business partner, that might cause more problems. Than <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, words of affirmation and um, acts of service and things like that. But people are motivated in the same way, whether they're motivated by um, being fulfilled by you know your girlfriend in a certain way, or you're fulfilled by your business partner, or even the feedback that you get from your, your clients and customers, you're always searching for that feedback to feel fulfilled. And that's been a big learning curve for me is now that we're scaling up, um, I'm having to get more empathetic and deal with how to motivate um, employees. Because mm-hmm. that's the only way I can scale. We're, we're as big as we can get with having me run the shop. So the next evolution for me is to become a better boss and be more empathetic and understand what motivates other people. So that book, even though I, I originally bought it because I was having massive uh, relationship problems, not, not with Disney, but um, previous girlfriend, but it was so impactful and it made me realize so much that I was doing wrong that it has huge carryover in the business world too. Because it's just human, it's human emotion, human interaction. That runs everything. It, it is, and I'm, yeah. I'm such a Vulcan, you know what I mean? Like I only care about one thing, and that's freedom, right? The freedom to experience life any way I want to. The easiest way to do that is to make enough money, you can do whatever the fuck you want. So that's why I really like money because like money by itself is useless. It's, it's literally paper or ones and zeros on a computer screen. It's the, the most absolutely useless fucking thing ever. But it's what you can purchase with it and trade it in for mm-hmm. that you can pretty much convert it to anything you want, you know? With and the reason. possibilities it allows you. Yeah, and that's what I want to do is be able to experience life any way I want to. I want to go experience what it's like to, you know, ride on a freaking jet across the Arctic Circle, you know? Like, that, that'd be fucking cool. I want to go do that. Yeah. yeah. So, but to do that, you need money. Um, but our employees aren't motivated by that. Some of our employees want stability. They want a white picket fence, you know what I mean? They want to do work nine to five and then come home. Um, some people want words of affirmation. They want to be told, you know, hey, you're doing a great job on this. So for me, being so... That's crazy how much different everybody is. Isn't it weird? Yeah. Like the, the white picket fence and yeah. like the nine to five life just oh, fucking kill me. Oh, I shoot myself. Dude, not at all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But for those people, like, 
that's what motivates them. So that book helped me realize that I need to get a lot better at understanding other people if I want to grow my business. Um, Every girlfriend I've ever had told me to read that book. Well, there you so go. we have another thing in common. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> yeah, but it's, it's the nice thing about it too. It's not like a cover to cover book. You go take the little test on what what you are, and then you only have to read a couple chapters, and you're like, oh, I get it. Um, and like you said, I think it helps you in so many other aspects of your life as well. Not to be like manipulative or anything mm-hmm. like that, but it really helps to like walk into a room and be able to understand who you're talking mm-hmm. to and who that person wants you to be, especially kind of like in a business sense, mm-hmm. you know, make them feel secure, make them feel safe if they're investing in you, if they're trying to work with you, oh, yeah. whatever yeah. it is, right? So if they're able to relate to you, not that you need to be fake or anything, but if you understand what they're looking for, it's a lot easier for you to give out that vibe. Yeah, it's just communicating, like being open and honest with what you want and trying to figure out what they want and it's so much more efficient and faster to figure out the human piece of it. Um, yeah. Because I sucked at that for a long time. I was such like a, my natural default is like an engineer, like straight analytics, like mm-hmm. robot, you know right. what I mean? Like right. when I was growing up, I had no sense of humor. I didn't understand like sarcasm. I, I like somebody tell me a joke and be just like, just a waste of time. I just stare at him like, I don't understand humor at all. <laughs> <laughs> so, what it, so that's my That makes for a good buzz instructor right there. <laughs> yeah. But the weird thing is, um, part of this is that my dad wasn't, I didn't grow up with my dad. So like guy humor, you oh, know, yeah, like, yeah. oh, whatever, like, like busting each other's balls. And yeah. Stuff. And I never yeah. played any sports. So like, I never had that. So for me going into the SEAL teams, so much stuff went over my head that I'm telling jokes. I'm like, I don't understand what the fuck they're talking about. <laughs> so I, I had to go through and literally, as, as a kid, analyze what it was that made things funny. So I would literally hang out with my friends that were funny and be like, okay, is the content of what they said? Is the context of the way they said it? Is it the pause that they did it? Is their facial expressions? like The how, delivery? Yeah. yeah. How, how, how are they getting this reaction mm-hmm. from people? Um, so I had to actually like analyze it, dissect it, figure it out, and try to replicate it. Um, and now I'm funny as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But um, it it really shaped kind of. It helped me become not an extrovert, but not so much of an introvert that I would be. When I was younger, I was like incapable of conversation. Mm-hmm. Like I just was. I got to recess, and I'd literally be the kid to go out and sit at the at the door and eat my lunch at the door because I didn't know how to communicate with people. It was totally weird. Um, yeah, I, I don't say about people like that. Yeah. That's crazy though. That, like, usually those people stay like that the entire their entire life. Mm-hmm. Like, it's crazy that you were able to like figure it out. Like, this is a weakness of mine and yeah. I need to change it. I think, do you think Navy SEALs had, like, I can imagine just being there and just fucking busting balls and you kind of got to get that like quick sense of humor so you can like get the humor off of you and like project it onto a Well, there's, guy. there's definitely some motivation to, uh, to, not stand out there yeah yeah <laughs> yeah for sure but yeah it was so my default setting is like very analytical so like that's why business is so when I first got into business I thought oh it's just ones and zeros and if you do this and you'll get this outcome and I had no idea how much actual personality and communication came into play but now that we've been working with so many other brands I realized that it, it is a massive amount I'd say like 80 80 to 90 percent of of not not starting a business but scaling a business and keeping it successful mm-hmm. is communication. It really is. Hmm. Super interesting. So I ask this question a lot actually, but you might actually be the perfect person in the world to ask this just because you work with so many businesses mm-hmm. that are just starting out. In exactly like in today's society, since you work with so many businesses, what are the most common flaws you see in people starting their own brands? Uh, it depends on the brand. Um, but typically it's... They focus too much on the idea and they wait to get perfect when in reality the execution is what matters. Mm -hmm. You got to understand that your first product is not going to be perfect. You just got to have something that you're you're relatively proud of that you can stand behind and be open to the feedback. And once you get feedback, like, okay, here's how we're going to fix it and do round two. We're on iPhone, what, 10 now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know? I mean, (laughs) but if they came out, it's a good point. Yeah, but they, if they waited till iPhone 10 we'd never have an iPhone they did the one like hey this is good enough here you go right and then they're like oh iPhone 2 and people are, are gaming for it you know but business is always like that it's never going to be perfect you just have to have the balls to throw something out there and run with it but also it's that balance between like hyper aggression and then you know humility you have to have the balls to throw it out there but also the humility 
to temper the feedback and be like, okay, here's how we're going to deliver a better product, you know? Because uh, a lot of people don't do that. They have, you know, one hit and they're like, okay, that's it. And then we're just going to sell this thing forever. Mm -hmm. And they don't change. And then it, it, you run, you know, three to five, maybe seven year cycle and then you're done. Yeah, I could totally see that. Just kind of grasping onto a little baby and like, this is exactly what I wanted to do and we're going to do this like this forever. Yeah, because nobody wants to change. It's hard to change, dude. And like, nowadays, everything's changing like so yeah. fast. Yeah, so fast. much fast. So fast, dude. dude. Because like social media, like any any song nowadays is like cool for a week and then yeah. everyone just forgets about it. Yeah, it's not I literally bad. haven't even heard like a like a metal song or like a classic rock song and forever like there's no one really replicating that no that genre anymore it's no, like EDM or hip hop e hip hop even is turned into just <laughs> just, yeah, like, <laughs> just like mumbling now yeah they're like I'm so fucking rich <laughs> it just doesn't even matter <laughs> Dude, I'm gonna start taping the sound of me taking a shit and that's gonna be fucking worth a million bucks yeah but totally. um yeah, somebody could sell that, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. And they talk about it. But just like going viral and all that stuff, it's so insane how it works. And it just it's so fast that you just have to be able to adapt to it. Like the fucking Yodel Boy that we're talking about at Walmart, this show's going to air in like four weeks and no one's going to know who that kid is anymore. Mm -hmm. You know? And so adapting to something like that, I think is huge instead of just grasping onto one idea and just syncing with it. Yeah. And the nice thing too is that, um, so like if you think about it, a couple of years ago, the only way to get exposure was like before Facebook that was more than a couple years ago now but the only way to get exposure was through television right and that was a massively expensive production process mm -hmm. it took a long time but now we can literally sit here on our phone and it was expensive yeah massively prohibitively expensive. social media is free it's free yeah this is this is literally the best time in the history of the human race to launch a company it really is the tools that you have today some of them didn't exist three or four years ago. Yeah. Instagram didn't exist four years ago, whatever it is, you know? Like, when we first started, first company, there was like MySpace, you know? Facebook wasn't around. And it, so it's good and bad. Like, back then, you could launch something and it was good because the competition was less. So if you did a few things, you could stand out. But now, it's so easy to do that everything is so saturated. So you have to do different things to stand out. It's, it's constantly changing, man. Yeah, it blows me away how fast it's yeah. changing now. It is crazy for sure. You guys in business to business, how much social media stuff do you guys use? Um, not enough. Um, I definitely notice when I do have a little bit of time, mm -hmm. I'll post more uh, on my own page and the business page. And then we notice about like a week or two later, we see a, a great big influx of uh, interest in what we're doing. Well, okay. And more clients, more business. Um, but when I clam up and I, I don't have time to do those things, that, uh, the, that new client business slows down quite a bit. Okay. So how much other advertising outside of social media in general do you guys do? We don't. And th the reason for it right now is that we're, we're almost maxed out with what we can do. Okay. Um, we were maxed out three months ago and I hired, um, a sales rep and an assistant for Disney. Disney, uh, is my fiance, but she's also my CEO. So she runs my whole basically runs my whole company. She's amazing at it. She's in my room right now working. Yeah, <laughs> she is. Yeah, actually. Yeah. yeah, she was working on the way up here. Um, she's, she's a lot like me. We get along really well. What is a, So let's say I'm a company and I'm reaching out to you right now. What What is my scenario coming into you for your help? And then what are you going to do for me? The, over the last couple of years... Just so people power. understand exactly what it is that yeah. you do and how you make them... Basically, yeah. our, our best thing that we can do is um, the most value we can bring is a company that's already kind of built up a following, built up a little bit. Like a clothing brand? Usually clothing brand, yeah. Okay. Or, or at least a business that's selling, um, selling apparel as a product. Okay. Um, but so some of our companies in like the logging industry, right? One company has um, this product that uh, splits logs, you know, and they want to get into apparel. And they have a little bit of a following. Um, so typically a company that's about selling eighty to hundred thousand dollars of the product a year, we've I think our fourth or fifth brand now that we've brought them from, you know, the hundred thousand dollar mark to the million dollar mark within nine to twelve months. So Whoa. yeah. And what does that process look like? What what exactly do you guys do for them? Basically, um, when you're selling about like, you know, twenty to fifty thousand dollars annual it's just like you just go down to the corner store and you get your prints, your stuff printed and it's like no big deal and 
and you're selling to your like your homies and stuff like that. Yeah. When you get to the hundred thousand dollar mark, you're starting to sell to people that aren't your friends, the people that don't that don't know you. So you're starting to branch out of your circle. So they expect a little bit of higher quality than than just the, the corner shop. Um, printing is one of those things where it's super easy to do, but it's super hard to do well. So we work with a variety of print shops that are really good at what they do, um, and we've streamlined our production process. So when these guys come to us, uh, normally the brand is they're scaling up, but they're having problems with the quality, they're having problems with the deadline, they're having problems with the print shop not being able to deliver what they say they can, when they can. They're having problems with their customer base, being like, oh, we're, you know, we really want this drop, and you guys are a week behind schedule, and they're like, fuck, what do we do? So we come in as we basically take all that. We handle it for them. They email us like, hey, here's our design files. Here's what we want. We're like, no problem. Deliver product to them in two, two and a half weeks. And it's exactly what they need. It's fully private labeled with their own custom branded neck label, folded and bagged, 100% guaranteed by us that it's gonna be quality stuff, like exactly what they ordered. So we're a little bit more expensive than a normal print shop, but what they get out of that is a lot more valuable. So then they just put it in their warehouse, send that to their customers, and we take all it off their plate. And then we also... And so you guys don't send it, they have to send it? We can send it too, we can okay. do fulfillment. Um, most of the brands we work with uh, already have their own warehouse, their own okay. stuff. Um, usually what I recommend is that they do their own fulfillment because especially when a brand is first starting out, that custom touch goes so far. So like. If you're the brand owner, even if you just write thanks on every packing slip, that takes you, what, five minutes a day maybe to go through it? But if somebody pulls it out yep. from a brand they love. Throw in a sticker or yeah, something like that. They're like, oh, he signed this himself. I like, went to the huge. Fitness Business Summit in San Diego two, like, two, three weeks ago. Oh, yeah, yeah. And the guy who owns First Form Supplements. Oh, right. Uh, Andy, yeah. Oh, yeah, you actually reposted his Lamborghini. Yeah, yeah. we've been chatting on Instagram quite a bit. Yeah. So he his, his business model... He has an entire team. I mean, he makes hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah. It's out of control. If you guys don't know who I'm talking about, he owns First Form Supplements. Andy Frisella, right? Andy yeah. Frisella. He actually has a great podcast as well. Mm -hmm. um, does not give a fuck about anything. Yeah, the He's motherfucking awesome CEO. CEO. <laughs> which, is, which is great. I love, 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 love that because I feel like there's a couple people in this room that are about the same. So, mm -hmm. um, he has an entire department where the only thing they do is write handwritten cards. Yeah. To every person who buys their supplements, handwritten, it says thank you yeah. or whatever. And he says like the amount of loyalty that he builds from that is literally priceless. Like, oh yeah, he's like, I don't fucking care how much money that these it costs me to hire someone to just sit there all fucking day and write it. I will pay for that all day long. And anybody who comes in my industry and tries to come up against me will be destroyed because you will get a product instead of like a relationship. He's like, and I'm the fucking relationship like every time. No, absolutely. And most people don't know enough about the product anyway to know what the fucking difference is. You yeah. know what I mean? Like I've been involved in fitness, not at the same level you guys are, but I've been around it for long enough. I don't know the fucking difference. Yeah. I know casing is different the way, but I don't know why. So I'll buy whatever the fuck. But the Most people is, aren't going to do the research really. Right, I mean, the, you're probably going to wind up talking to the person who wants to know every single question, but the reality is that 90% of them don't really care. They, they just want, whatever yeah, the they want you them. to tell it. I mean, people, I don't, people email me all the time and say, hey, is this product good? When all they had to do was a little bit of research, but they're like, hey, Ryan Fisher said it was good. It's fine. Yeah. yeah. No, absolutely, man. All the time. Yeah. And that, that relationship, dude, it comes back to communication. It mm -hmm. really is. But that's, that's the number one thing that I tell all these clients that come to us is like, as an apparel brand, you're not really selling apparel. You're selling a lifestyle. The mm -hmm. apparel is just a way for somebody to buy into your lifestyle. And to represent their lifestyle. Right, yeah. exactly. Like a t-shirt's like a tattoo that you put on for the day, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah. like I, I want to look like Oh, this, I kind of like that. Yeah, 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 like Iron Maiden. Some days yeah. you're feeling Iron Maiden, you know? Sometimes you just want to put on like a plain yeah. plain shirt. Like I love like Patagonia because yeah. like what they stand for. Such a rad brand. Mm -hmm. Just saying. <laughs> Shout out! I am wearing an Iron Maiden shirt now. It has nothing to do with Patagonia. But uh, I'm trying to get sponsorships left that's, and right. That's not a Patagonia shirt, is it? No, 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 no. Oh, no, I was saying that. I'm wearing an Iron Maiden shirt, not a yeah. Patagonia shirt. But uh, I just think it's cool that they they take a lot of their money and they put it into like the actual place of Patagonia in Chile. And, oh, really? And they uh, like a lot of that money goes back to the land to keep it from not being built on yeah. and all that. Like the 
the lifestyle of it, yeah. I think is really rad. Having a mission, having substance behind it goes a long way. Something for people to buy into, you know? It's not just a show mm-hmm. with a print on. There's something That's a more to say about it. Yeah, Like exactly. Tom's shoes, they're giving a pair of shoes away. Yeah, I was going to say that. I was going to bring that up too. So when people buy Tom's shoes, like, they, they, the shoes might be whatever, but they want to be known as, hey, I buy Tom's shoes because I'm a good fucking person. I care about this <laughs> shit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know I mean? So that's that thing, like, it costs them a little bit of money, but what they get back is is massive in terms of, like, market share and, and that that communication it's huge, man. So what made you fall into that now? So like, I think what happens with all of us is we're all, we we have a vision, we start on that vision, things change, we go with the change. Mm-hmm. Um, like, were you in the middle of something that you like, you kind of liked and you're just like, man, like when I see this next thing, I'm just going to pounce on it. And then obviously you pounce on the right thing. Well, yeah, it was kind of weird. Um, I never even thought of this as a viable business model. Neither did I. I didn't even know what this was until I, I still don't. I still, people yeah. like even I was like, "What does this guy do?" I was, like, <laughs> I know, right? I still I was trying know. to explain it to him. I was like, "He's going to do better than I will." Bro, but. I still don't know how to describe it. It's it's weird. Um, so what I did, my job in Forge and, and the apparel that I had before was that I was basically the production manager. So I would do the designing, um, and then I would like put together tech packs and make sure that everything everything worked correctly and interface with the print shop. Make sure that um, excuse me, everything is going correctly. Just basically run run the production. And so when you're in a apparel brand, your other friends that have businesses typically go to you and be like, "Hey, we're having problems with our print shop." Which is print shops are notorious for having major problems. I agree. Um, even even the print shops, you no, know, even the print shops we work with, like if we didn't have our systems in place and leverage our volume to control the product output. Even they have massive problems, but we just, you know, we do at least a million dollars a year with each of them. So, like, they don't want to fuck up. Yeah, you're you yeah. priority. Yeah, so we go in there. We're like, hey, this needs to be like this. This needs to be like this. We basically have control over all their employees to get what we need done. Um, so I was doing that with with Forge, and uh, our friends would come to us and be like, hey, can you produce these shirts for us? And we're like, yeah, sure. It was kind of like a homey thing. Um, and I'd, I've been doing it on the side since like 2009. But I didn't really think of it as a business until uh, I sold sold everything, sold Demon Bells, and I'm like, it's the first time in like eight years I had a break. I'm like, okay, well, you know, what do I do now? And um, I had a couple friends that owned apparel lines that were having having problems with production, and they were they were paying like at a thousand units, they were paying like ten dollars a shirt. I'm like. Crazy, bro. Ten dollars. I'm like, holy crap, man. Yeah. I'm like, dude, I'll get those to you the exact same product for six dollars, you know, six fifty if it's still print. And he's like, bro, you can do that. Awesome. I'm like, hell yeah, let me do it. So, times ten thousand that's a lot of money, yeah. So, it do we saved him a massive amount of money. Um, he was a pretty, pretty big brand. So, then in, in you know, tactical circles, so then, um we ended up getting referrals from them. We were like, oh, who does your shirts? He's like, oh, I go through Ryan. And I'm like, oh, I guess I should make a company around this. So we ended up building it out. And I had no idea if it was going to work. Um, I'm like, I'm just going to do it like as like, you know, a homey thing for a little while, um, see if it works. And we ended up getting enough enough steam, enough momentum, enough interest that I'm like, okay, let's find a name and let's put it together and um, let's make it a real business. Um, and then there's always levels to this, you know? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. And it's like, okay, we're, you know, doing, you know, hundred, two hundred thousand dollars $200,000 a year in business. I'm like, okay, this is cool. I can still have my day job, do this on the side. And then started to get more. I'm like, oh my God. So we got up to a million dollars a year in business. Not, not net, um, just gross. We run really small margins. Excuse me. So we got it. I got it up to a million dollars a year in gross by my fucking self. No employees, no nothing. Wow. With a day job, I'm like, holy fucking shit, dude! Like completely unsustainable. I was getting up at like four or five in the morning, driving to the print shop, approving stuff, getting stuff organized, leaving at like seven a.m., going to my day job, getting off there at like two p.m., going back to the print shop, finalizing everything, shipping it out, going home, emails to like, you know, midnight, one in the morning, and no time to spend with my girl. It was miserable. I mean, we were making decent money, but um, it, it was totally unsustainable, you know? I mean, you know how it is. Like, you can do that for a little while, and then you're like, fuck this. Um, 
So my first. And then year, nothing matters anymore either. Like, yeah. I don't even care how much money I make. No, it's not worth it. No, nothing matters worth it at all. Right. right. And then you're you're a prisoner of your own creation. Um, so Disney at the time was going through um, nursing school, and she had this this career path and this goal forever, and she really wanted to do it. And I was like, dude, that's that's awesome, honey. Like, totally go for it. And she was getting frustrated because she's she would get put in a position where she knew what was right and what had to be done at the hospital, but she wouldn't be allowed to make decisions for her comfort, her patient's comfort because of bureaucratic bullshit in the hospital system. And she's like, why can't I do what I know is right for the patient? Why can't I just do this? Like, I see what needs to be done. Why can't I do it? She felt completely disempowered. So she was frustrated, and I'm frustrated with my job. And I didn't want to push her to be like, hey, you want to come work for me? But <laughs> finally, she's like... I don't know if I want to do this anymore. I'm going to look at doing something else. I'm like, thank God you said that because I need some fucking help. And um, she's extremely detail-oriented, um, very pragmatic, almost like like a numbers nerd like I am. I've known her for 10 minutes. I think that she's very... <laughs> she walked in within like two seconds. She had the laptop and the right? notebook and the phone. Like everything set up on the table. Dude, yeah, she's, she's like, this is too loud, and I'm gonna go somewhere else because I need to work, and I'm yeah. gonna work. <laughs> no, right on. She's, she's very motivated. She's, yeah, and it's been fantastic. So she's my first employee, um, and it's I'm so fortunate that I was able to hire my girlfriend at the time, who's also my best friend, and we still have a good relationship, and we piss each other off like crazy sometimes. But it's gonna happen. Yeah, it's gonna happen. Um, but at the end of the day, like she's in a position now where if she feels like something's fucked up she is completely empowered to make whatever changes she deems necessary she can if we fuck something up and it benefits both of you both ways yeah absolutely like if we we fuck something up we need to refund a customer she doesn't need to check with me she's like totally this is incorrect we're going to refund you for this and she comes to me she's like here sign this check i'm like okay cool like she's 100 percent um on it man it's, it's been amazing and that goes back to the freedom that you were talking about at the beginning of the episode you know it's yeah. not just about money it's not just about this it's about like freedom of freedom. choice and right. doing the things that you think are right and having the power to like actually go and like, execute them as well right and feel empowered to like like you're doing something you know like I, I love this job because what we're able to do with our clients is that they all have this dream you know they all they want to build something and we can we show them like, hey, use our system. This is this is what we see working. Like, do this, and we can help you get to here. And they do it, and they're able to execute on it. And we're able to help them build their dreams. And dude, for me, I I learned a shit ton from every one of our clients, and we help them grow. And you can see them just like reaching their goals and getting excited about setting new ones. I'm like, dude, that for me is so fulfilling, you know. Mm-hmm. And we make we make decent money we make very small margins though but because we do such a massive volume of work yeah it ends up adding up um but then we run into uh, our latest problem is scaling so like we still only have a team of like four or five so now i gotta add like fuck, i wish i could find the right like three or four people right now i'd fucking hire them on the spot <laughs> but it's finding those people mm-hmm. uh, it's your family i mean you're gonna be around those people it really is, yeah that's how I feel about coaches at my gym for yeah, sure. Just like give out that vibe for sure. So if I've learned anything about you in the last hour, you're like the typical entrepreneur. So usually those kind of people have something new like in the back of their head, another idea. Um, do you yeah. have anything cooking on the side that might... You know, I've, I've thought about it. I, mean, I have a million ideas, but at the same time, you know, so does everybody else. Yeah. So like I always think about it. I, I put it through a filter for a couple things. Number one, um, how profitable will it be? How easy is it to execute? How much capital will it take up? And how fast can we get it to the point where it's making money? Mm-hmm. And once I put it through those filters, I'm like, fuck, I don't have that many ideas. <laughs> 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 Everything sounds really cool until you're like, wait, how am I going to do killed off like, pretty fast. Yeah, so there's a couple things um, that I think would be rad that I personally love to see like as a consumer mm-hmm. that I think should be out there. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to execute on a couple of them. We're just so busy with our own shit. It's, it's, it's hard to find super time. Hard. I have so many ideas. And, like, I literally have a problem sleeping at night because that's when they all hit me. Yeah. And, right. like, <laughs> and like how to orchestrate them, that's when it hits me. Like, the whole, the entire process of how it should be done hits me as soon as I hit the freaking pillow. Dude. Yep. And it's just, like, the worst feeling ever. And I remember going to that fitness summit, uh, this, like, business summit thing in San Diego a few weeks ago. This guy was like... It was the first time in my life where I 
legitimately believe that niche or niche was like a cool thing to be in. Because I was always like, man, like, why would I market to this small group when I can market to, you know, this like a fitness group? Like, mm-hmm. forget about cross. What about just like fitness people in general? Yeah. But those aren't really the people that make money. It's the it's the niche people that actually do really well. And I've heard you speak on a couple different podcasts where you like you're a, you know a believer in the niche group. And I feel like if you're good at your niche, like you could really really crush. Well, I think I think niches are like they're like toeholds, right? So like you you if you it's like climbing a wall. So if you have this wall of like fitness industry. Like holy shit, good fucking luck, you know? It's it's massive. It's like you guys watch Game of Thrones? I have never watched it. Oh my god. Me neither. You're probably in the room with the only two people that have oh, watched Jesus. it. <laughs> I just can't do T V shows that sucks you in for too long. Dude, it does. It really I can't does. do a seer. I can only do a movie and that's it, I'm done. Okay, don't do it. It's <laughs> it's really awesome though. So anyway, it's just massive fucking like four hundred foot tall ice wall. That's like the fitness industry. Like it's you you can't just go like climbing up and spread out and just go over the top of it. Um you to find like a, a niche that, that you can get something in there. And maybe there's like a, I like to call it columns of influence, right? So like the fitness column is like this massively round thing that goes up a hundred feet. The CrossFit column is a lot smaller. So you can, if you enter into the fitness realm, you're gonna get lost like right away. Mm-hmm. But if you enter into the CrossFit realm, it's a lot smaller. So you can do things to get yourself to the top of it a lot easier and once you're in the top of this niche then you get noticed by another niche and then you can um, you know sidestep over to that do things to get bigger in that niche and then you know slowly climb your way up to the top of this massive market through you know building and maintaining um, the presence in, in small niches um, which I think is really impressive with you what you've done with um, you know obviously the the athlete thing and now um, the online. business part of it, yeah, yeah, the business part of it with the CrossFit gym, like it's huge. I think I was like one of the first people to make my gym like an online gym, and I always, I really just thought it was like, I was like, oh, I wonder how many like I I was the first gym to ever open that was like really really cool. Like I spent a lot of money. It was like a million dollar CrossFit gym, which was really rare at the yeah. time because everybody's gym was like sixty grand. You know, yeah. it was like a really <laughs> small project, and mine was massive. And my business partner actually made MySpace. So he has millions of dollars. Oh, no way. <laughs> yeah, I went to high school with one of the guys that built MySpace. That's funny, dude. Definitely not this guy because he was born in New Zealand. But, uh, oh, different guy. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, he, like, made the whole operating software for MySpace. He's, Dang. like, a genius. And um, I remember just, like, the first day I was like, I'm not going to put my workouts online. Like, every gym puts their workouts online. Why would I do that? Like, mm-hmm. I want people to see my gym being successful one day and be like, what the fuck do they do in there? And then I still, like, it took four years until I was – until I saw that, like, by me not doing that, I was like, I'm going to put my workouts online now, and I'm going to make it 20 bucks, and I'm going to see who signs up. Yeah. And it started off as, like, you know, like, this really small chunk of change, and then I just, every single month, it's been going up, like, it, yeah. and it keeps going up, and I'm literally, like, always fathomed by it. I'm always just like, holy crap, like, the amount of time I do yeah. put into my workouts, like, really is, like, spreading. Like, people all over the world really like my workouts, they really, like... They like the amount of work I'm putting in. And Good it's... programming is hard, dude. It really is, man. And that that's that's the magic sauce in a gym, dude. Like, you go to a gym to get results and not just go fuck around and bump chest with people. Like, like the programming is, is the key, you know? And not a lot of people know enough to do, like, quality programming, man. That's the number one thing people... I always say, like, what do you like about my gym? I always want them to say it's, like, the cool vibe. But they're like... I mean, it is... But they're like, number one's the programming, and then the cool yeah. vibe. I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, it's so we, we had a CrossFit gym before, and it was, we did it just as like a marketing arm so that we could have t-shirts to say like CrossFit forwarded on it. Yeah. Um, so we I remember that time. Really, yeah, it was fun, man, and it worked, but we never really charged anybody any money for it. it was, and if we did, it was like, you know, our homies are charging like 20 or 30 bucks a month or something. But one day we got this idea like, oh, we're going to actually like make it a gym and charge people a real amount. And, Worst fucking idea ever, dude. Because as soon as we started um, charging them for it, it just killed the vibe and the hard charging, just people showing up and doing whatever we posted for the maximum amount, just crushing it, just went out the window and they were just like going through the motions again. And we just canceled it right after that, man. Um, But I was doing the programming for the gym. Dude. It It just takes time. Yeah, it takes time. I sucked at it in the beginning. Yeah, let's make it good. 
takes me a lot, 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 a lot of time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you for sure. I ended up building this uh, one of my side projects called Strength Alliance. Um, it still exists, but I haven't put any time into it, like a year. So I built the uh, workout program for the Navy SEAL uh, pipeline. So not not the Buds pipeline, but the SQT training pipeline afterwards. Mm-hmm. So they sent me to a bunch of different schools and said, hey, you're in charge of basically the fitness program for, for this. I'm like, well, fuck, all right. So I built it out and then tested it on like 1,200 students. Um, and it fucking, it works great. But it's for like, it's not for CrossFit. It's yeah. not for like, it's for testing for like bodyweight bench press, bodyweight squat, both for max reps. Um, like bodyweight, like, like I do like 205, you know. Um, max pull-ups with weight. Uh, and some other basic stuff. So it was like strength endurance type stuff mixed with CrossFit. Not for the sake of CrossFit, but CrossFit as like a conditioning tool. Mm. And dude, it worked great, man. I I dip back into it every once in a while and it's like fucking crushing, dude. But That's super cool. Yeah, you can apply that to so many different like aspects. Yeah. Dude, I think there was some really good stuff in this. Um, definitely like the business side of things. I loved it. Um, brain grew again. Do you have anything else you wanted to add? No, I think that's pretty good. Uh, I love the the whole business that you guys have going on. is really, really cool. And I think that if I had a big brand, I think I'd probably be reaching out to you right now. That sounded <laughs> yeah. really good to me. I was like, damn. Uh, like, if people are reaching people. out, where can they find you? You said you were hiring some people too. You guys taking applications? We need to, yeah, yeah. I need I need a photographer. I need a videographer. I need a social media guy. I need as many sales reps as I can get. Um, that's that's what I need like today. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but we'll see. Yeah, um, our website is kind of there. It's it's kind of like we get all our business from referrals. So like industrythreadworks.com is there. But most of our stuff, like the day to day, like to get, actually get a feel for what we do, is mostly on social media. So okay. it's industry underscore threadworks on Instagram, and then my personal one is uh, Invictus fifty three twenty six. Which I posted on my IG. Um, all right, yeah, yeah. Anything you have going on over there? Um, been building out just the graphic design side of things. So I don't know how much you guys know, but I do all the chalk, put all the chalk stuff, not all the real chalk production side, all the graphic design stuff, everything you guys see on social media, any picture, video, all that stuff that Ryan's posts. Most likely, I was involved in that at some point. So I'm currently building more of like an agency side of that. Might hire a couple of people so we can get more work done and get that even quicker. Awesome. So if any of you guys love that kind of stuff and um, really that design stuff. If you need any of that, you guys can always hit me up on my Instagram at Yaya's View or just at um, Yaya at CrossFitChalk.com. Either one of those options will work. All right, guys. You know me, uh, CrossFit Chalk. Got my online programming going on. If you guys have a business out there and you don't want to program for your gym anymore, that's where I come in. Uh, we have a huge following. We've got hundreds of hundreds of gyms that follow my programming. And if you're an individual and you work out in your garage or something and you just need a little bit of inspiration, I got you. CrossFitChalk.com. Click on Chalk Online. You guys are good to go. Thank you, Ryan Williams, for being on the show. Dude, thanks for having me, man. Giving people awesome. motiv- mo- some motivation. You! Seriously, yeah. I want to start like a business right now. Yeah, I hope you guys are fired up. <laughs> <laughs> hope you guys are fired up like we are. And, uh... Getting on with your day. All right. See you guys later. Thanks, see you guys later. And that will do it. If that didn't get you off your couch wanting to start your own business, then I don't know what will. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Hope you guys had a blast. As always, subscribe, record. That's not right. Comment, all that stuff. You know what I'm talking about. You've heard us a million times. We still need you guys to interact with us or want you guys to interact with us. It really helps the show grow. It makes us know what you guys like what you guys dislike, what you guys want to see, except for Ryan with a shirt off because we've all seen way too much of that. So let's keep that away from everybody. It's not PG anyways. Not that this show is, but you guys know what I'm talking about. So tell your friends, tell your mom, tell your dad, tell everybody. Real Chalk Podcast is on the Baba Shrug Collective. We're coming in hot. See you all next week.